I'm an enthusiast. I, I like Rebel. I think it's fun. And um, so I'm not going to try to sell you the idea that it, you know, that I'm, uh, you know, a guru uh, like uh, Carl Sassenrath is. Um, this is his invention, and um, it's something that he did. Oh, I think starting in about 95, 1995, um, if I got my dates right. Um, and it's basically uh, a rebellion against software complexity and against bloat in software. Um, so we're going to do the whole presentation from the CD here. And we'll start with the index file. So it's uh, aimed more at, at least at the top level, at an average user than it as, is at a programmer. So it's not, uh, it doesn't have the usual programmer's construct. It's not like other languages like C or uh, like any of the, you know, the other kinds of languages. Um, to me, the most important part is the documentation here and also the script library. Now, this is Rebel 1.2. This is the last version that ran on an Amiga, okay? Um, and up until, uh, and that's uh, view, uh, Rebel View 1.2. Uh, Rebel View 2.7. Uh, is currently up on rebel.com's website. Uh, it does not run on, on an Amiga, and there is no distribution you know, on, that, on that level. Um, Rebel 3.0 is in alpha stage at this point, and it has just been made open source. Uh, I believe it was earlier this year or late last year. No, I think it was late last year. and. So now the source code is available, something Carl said he'd never do, uh, but he did. And uh, I think he was finally convinced of a way to do it that would... License Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I think he chose the GPL uh, and um, talked to, uh, you know, he had a lot of online comments, you know, you ought to talk to this guy, I forget what this guy's name is, uh, I think it's Andy something. Uh, knows a lot about the GPL, okay? So after a few comments like that, you know, he gets back on his blog and says, well, we had lunch yesterday. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think, and we talked about that. And so I, I think the GPL would be a, a great way to go. So a few modifications to the GPL, Rebel 3 is released as open source software. Um, it's already been compiled to run on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, it's been compiled to run on a couple of Android devices. Uh, so, um, and Stephen had started to compile it to run on OS 4 before it was released. Um, so, uh, well, it's, it's in his hands. Uh, whether we're getting it or not is uh, open to question uh, because he's very busy. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, a little short history of uh, Rebel releases there. Um, the biggest project here has been to uh, actually assemble the, the available documentation. Uh, and this caveat is given at the beginning because it is nowhere near a unified set of docs, okay? In order to do that, it's going to take continuing effort over a period of probably years uh, to, you know, make sure that everything that was clear to Carl in his head becomes clear to us in written form. That's a difficult task. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, who knows? Uh, <laughs> so um, there's some duplication. There's some lack of explanation. There's some lack of cross-references to relevant sections of other documents, OK? So with all that said, you know, uh, the answers to the basic questions are basically here. Um, what it is, how do I start, what's possible, uh, indicates the steps, uh, and it applies to Rebel 1.2. Um, 
after reading through the introductory uh, pages, which is in the, are in the next section, then uh, the tutorials and examples are probably you know, most interesting to people who are programmers and who want to get into Rebel Scripts and do Rebel Scripts on their own. Um, so uh, what, I, what I would like to actually take a look at first, and we'll come back to this, is I want to step through a few of the steps on the uh, tutorial just to show you how uh, some of the, uh, especially the, the GUI creation on uh, Rebel works. Uh, but just at the very top level, uh, Rebel is uh, not just a programming language, but a desktop. Uh, and you can use this desktop to launch Rebel scripts uh, and to uh, do various things. You can also use it to uh, browse the internet uh, in a different way. It's not a, it's not a full feature graphic web browser. Uh, and it also takes going to websites that have index.r files rather than index.html files. Um, so, uh, you know, one of my projects over the next year is to create an infocessories index.r site, a website, instead of a website. Um, but just to, uh, you know, if you want to operate from a console and you like that sort of thing, then you can just click there and you have a programmer's console to work from. Uh, and if you wanted to find out what today's date is, for instance, uh, you could do this and get the date in a calendar. Um, so, you know, we are right here on the 20th, bang, and there's your output from it, 20 October 2013. Now, this uses a system clock to do it. It, uh, it presumes that your system clock is set correctly. Uh, and so, uh, but is, you know, if you've forgotten what day it is, you can find out rather quickly. Um, or you can, if you want to find out even more immediately, you can just print that and it tells you. Date and time. Um, and you can do, I think this is the right one. Yeah, that is. Then you have a file chooser. Uh, you know, where you can open a file this way. And uh, so we'll use this later from the desktop to uh, do an example with what's called MakeDoc that generates web pages from text files. Uh, so it does have, you know, a, a, uh, an interactive console that's kind of nice, kind of neat, you know, very clean. Um, the desktop itself when it's connected to the internet. Right now, it's, you can see the local button down here. Uh, the local button means it's not connected to the internet, okay? When it is, you can uh, go to, uh, you know, websites that are, you know, that have content that you want to download, download them directly from this desktop. Um, the local folder, you can put any number of folders over here. There's a file that you edit called the folders.r file. And uh, so you can put other folders here. You want to see what that file looks like. Uh, the built-in Rebel editor gives you the ability to do that. So here you have your desktop, whoops, okay. Uh, and Whereas our services, I believe, is what it is. Bang. Oh, no, sorry. Wrong one. Uh, open. History, skins, icon, sounds, tools. No, nope, don't have any tools. That's right. Let's try that. Yeah, there's our folder definitions right there. So basically all you do is, you know, give the, the folder word is what creates this image, and then a title for it in, in uh, quotes, and then the location of the file, uh, which basically is, you know, just local slash index.r. And the index file is created automatically when you do this. Okay, so if you make another folder, it'll appear. Uh, 
And let's see if we can make one, see what, see what it says to us here. Folder. Test. Yeah, we'll go here. if this works like I think it should. Yep. Well, let's see let's see what we'll see what happens here. Okay. So it would probably test would probably need to be inside local. See if we have a test folder inside local now. No, nope, didn't work. Didn't take. What was that? Yeah. Uh, oh, didn't do it. So anyway, it's possible to redefine these folders over here. And these icons are connected to you know little widgets that are also available in your desktop, um, like a calculator. Uh, a real quick and dirty calculator is very simple. Uh, you have a clock that also shows up there. Uh, you have a calendar that you can use here that scales rather nicely. You want to take a look at that. And uh, let's see here. Where is my ah? This is my favorite. Uh oh, what happened to you? My Remtris isn't working. Uh, that's not working correctly. Mm -mm. I was referring to the wrong file, that's why. This is an example of a tutorial, the video interface dialect. Uh, and it's in the sidebar and content format here. Um, and you can see you know, these examples of what is the video interface dialect. It's one of the more powerful parts of Rebel. You can create dialects that are actually your own language. Um, and uh, Rebel by itself would take you know, more uh, script space in order to come up with a GUI, for instance. Uh, video interface dialect produces a, a GUI from that. A line of code, one. Uh, and as you go down here, you can see all of these things are examples. You can just click on them right here. It gives you some of the various things, the ways that the video interface dialect can be used. It can be used to display a list. And this read the directory that this is in. So uh, here's our basic functions. 
Um, <clears throat> so these are all things that if you close those windows, they persist. So if you launch those in that way from the desktop, they persist. Okay. Um, getting back to some of this documentation here, the intro is what what Carl wrote to explain what it is. Um, and the thing that I don't like about it is that it jumps right into programming language. You know, uh, what's a metadata language? Uh, and uh, there are very few people who would know what that is. Uh, so uh, it does give the structure of Rebel uh, as far as its underlying structure is concerned. And his ultimate goal, provide a new architecture for how information is stored, exchanged, or processed between all devices connected over the internet. So that's what he, you know, that, that was the idea behind the whole thing. And still is. So beyond using the desktop to launch files and, uh, you know, bring widgets up, you know, what else can you do with it? Um, and I think that that's probably the, uh, I closed my window, didn't I? Yeah. Um, that would be the the thing that most you know people would uh, you know would want to know. What can I do with it? And uh, you know why should I care? So the. Um, the really good, you know, meat and potatoes tutorial is right here. And it takes you from being, and it takes a long time to load because it's a very extensive tutorial. Um, it takes you from, from the perspective of someone who knows absolutely nothing about programming and steps you through it. Uh, starts out on the first link, you know, with, you know, what it is, what it isn't, um, and uh, Nick, on his own, I mean, on, on what he's done with Rebel is uh, he's created an entire online store that uses Rebel uh, and the Common Gateway interface uh, to run his online business. Um, so. Uh, Perspective for beginners, which I think you know is a good orientation toward what programming is, what it does. Uh, you know, let users input data, text, images, sounds, video, etc., and let users save, retrieve, organize, share, transfer, manipulate, alter, view, and otherwise deal with data in useful ways. So, uh, and it's really basic. I mean, obviously, people who know programming are not going to probably get the start at this level. Fortunately, you don't have to. Uh, but that's where he starts. And um, so, um, you know, he starts out with the hello world example. So, you know, while we're sitting here looking at it, uh, you know, we can bring Rebel up. I can get my window to the place where the icon will be accessible. And I'll bring this up here. Get my console going. Okay. So the typical gives you a window, not just a console line, a window. Um, and you click OK, and it's gone. So, in that three words of code, 
you have a window defined, it displays a line of text, and then when you click the button, because this is a special kind of window, it's an alert window. So your, your OK gets rid of it, right, like that. Um, so here's another way, basically shows you the view layout is what accesses the video interface dialect. All right, the video interface dialect is, comes, to, comes to into use when you put view as the first word. It then brings a whole separate metadata language into play. Because if you don't do that, let's, uh, let's just do this first, meta, uh, layout with size variation here. Size, square brackets, 400 by 300. Okay, so when you do that, you get a window. It's just a plain window, has nothing in it. Uh, and uh, it uses whatever your operating system is, in this case, Amiga OS 4. You know, these are the default colors that are used in Amiga OS 4 windows uh, at this level, at this point. So if you eliminated the view from the layout size like this, You don't get anything. It just sits there. So when you bring it back, you get the window. And so let's go on and do a few more examples of what we can do with that. Um, so view, now the, the square brackets here are, let's, let's dial back to that here. Um, the square brackets are necessary in order to, to tell the uh, interpreter that this is actually a, uh, a rebel script of some kind. And when you write a script, the square brackets contain the rebel header and the, uh, the minimum value there if you write a script uh, is square back or a square bracket the word rebel and then another square bracket. Um, in this case, on the command line, it doesn't even take the word rebel in between. So, view layout size, and let's say we want a button in the window. So you type in button like this, and you get a button, blue button, just like that. You can you can hit it; it doesn't do anything. There's nothing in it but it's there. So let's say you want something in the button. You can write, click here if you like. And you get that message in the button. Now it still doesn't do anything. You, you, you're still just you know creating a button. But as you can see, because it's a longer sentence or a longer text, it automatically adjusted for it wrapped around. Um, and uh, you can do that, uh, I believe, to the limits of your console, in this case, 250 characters. It'd be quite a button, uh, but, <laughs> but you can do it. Um, so that's the, the, the click me button. And so now let's get a little more complicated here. Uh, click here if you like, and then we're going to do another alert here uh, within the brackets. So, uh, alert, I'm alive. Let's see what we got. So when you click here if you like, you get an alert that says, I'm alive. <laughs> and then when you click OK here, the window goes away. Now, you want to see the window again? Just click here if you like. Remember, we still haven't gotten past one line of code, have we? We're generating two windows, two buttons, uh, two messages within the buttons, 
And uh, so uh, at, at some point down here at the bottom, he shows what it would take in C to actually make this happen. It's pages. Um, so let's see here. Let's stretch the interpreter out a little bit so we, we can get more, uh, we can see this better. Okay, so we've got a button going here. And so, you know, it's fun, but what do, we, what do you do with it? And why? Uh, so at this point now, we're gonna be able to, um, you know, use the actual, the actual program. Um, whoops, that's not what I want. That's not what I want either. Okay. There we go. There we go. So we're going to define a variable, data. Request text. View layout button click me alert data. And then 400 by 300. Okay, so let's see what, what this does. So you're going to enter some text here below. But shall we? Uh, we're here at Emmy West. You enter there. Click here. And so. Okay, I made a mistake here. Data, request text, view. Well, yeah, size button, click here if you like, alert. Oh, alert, data, that's what I did, sorry. So, we click here, and now we get our data. We're here at Miami West. So, we have actually defined a variable, collected data, uh, and reused it in the program. So, things are getting a little more complicated here. Now, what? Maybe you would like to save that data. So let's do that. So we, at the end of the program, we write write. Uh, percent, I think we'll go with CF1, because that's where we are. Uh, Data. So, we're going to store it on CF1, which is my compact flash drive here. Uh, it's going to be called data.txt, and it's going to take the data that we stick into it and save it. So, here we go. Enter text below. We're saving this data. Enter. Click here, we're saving this data, okay. Now, so that little requester that said request uh, uh, permission to open a port on CF1, if we go to CF1 here, let's see here where we are, what directory, we're in CF1, that's good. So, I'm gonna change We're going to change directory here to CF1. Oh, I always do that. I'm used to the Amiga convention.
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can't. I'll have to do the. I'll have to do this. Percent backslash. You think? Uh, all right. Okay, so we're there right now. All right, so let's see if we can find it here. Tell you what, we'll use an Amiga shortcut here to find data.txt. There it is. So it does write it and dis and display it. So just a short example, uh, and there's you know you can do this. Uh, you know, if you want to take an image or load an image off the internet, it doesn't have to be on your computer. Uh, we're not connected here at this point, but if we were, then we could go to use this to bring an image in from anywhere. Um, the end of this tutorial brings you, uh, you know, quite a distance in the way that, you know, you're able to use, uh, you know, all of this. And... So, <clears throat> uh, some of the strengths of doing a scripting language instead of a compiled language is that there's no compilation and you don't have to debug it. Uh, if you do make an error, well, like I did a couple of times there, you can see how it uh, gives you a message and tells you where you made your error. Uh, in fact, let's just do that again for fun uh, and just see where that error message comes in. So we've got that right there. Um, so if you're going to do a uh, directory like this, directory has no value. Where halt view near directory? which tells me that because it has no value, it stopped the, the interpreter and where you made your mistake was right there. So you don't have to wonder where you made your error, it tells you. Uh, <clears throat> now in a more complicated script, uh, it'll go as far as it can go. When it hits the error, it just it spits out the, the line where you made the error, right here. Um, so, you know, at this point, I'm still learning this. Uh, I think it's a great way to do simple things simply. And uh, most of the things that I want to do are pretty simple. Uh, it can also do very complex things, very simply. Uh, and others have done them online. Uh, there's uh, the script library that's included in the distribution. It has 350 scripts in it. Uh, and they do a wide variety of things. Uh, one of the one of the things I like to use um, in uh, the desktop is a um, let me just find my Rebidex here. A little address book facility right here, uh, and uh, it's just something that's real simple, real easy to use. Uh, you don't really have to call up a complicated piece of software, uh, and you can use this information uh, very easily and very quickly. And you, and you can also get rid of it very easily and very quickly. So, just a, I mean, 
didn't even scratch the surface, you know, kind of, uh, you know, just use a little mirror, it shows you a little bit about what's in there. And, you know, like I said, the, uh, the most uh, valuable thing that's included in here is this documentation, and particularly this tutorial. Uh, so I hope it makes you a little bit curious about Rebel, and uh, hope to have uh, a lot more information for you uh, uh, at the next AmbuWest. Uh, and uh, just hope that in the meantime, uh, you can uh, do some of your own Rebel experiments and find out more about it. So uh, thanks for listening. I appreciate your time. And uh, hopefully I made you curious. Thank you. Sure. Good night.